Y'all reminded me of something my wife told me years ago when she used to ride the church bus to church. She had a, a bus driver. His name was Happy Jack Fell. Remember what he said? Walking with the Lord just gets getting better and better and sweeter and sweeter. That was a good memory y'all brought this morning, a good song. Thank y'all so much. Before we get started this morning, I just want to say just a few words about our annual conference, the annual conference of the Alabama Emerald Coast Conference that met at St. James on Friday and Saturday. Uh, I know some of you came and worshiped with us, and I think you sensed, as I did and my father did, the Spirit of God moving mightily uh, in uh, our conferencing, uh, our holy conferencing. We had a great time. Uh, it was good to see uh, so many like-minded people there. Uh, our business session took one hour. Uh, if you know anything about annual conference, that was a miracle. Uh, <laughs> but we were so excited that uh, we were able to focus on the Spirit of God, on prayer, on preaching, on uh, just uh, fellowshipping with each other. Uh, it was just a very spirit-filled, spirit-led conference. And I think everybody walked away knowing that uh, they had been in the presence of the Lord. And that's what we're talking about this morning, being in the presence of Jesus. And when we're in the presence of Jesus, our life changes for the better. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 4. But let me encourage you to go home this afternoon and read all three chapters, 4, 5, and 6, because I'm going to be preaching from all three of these chapters. Uh, and just ask the Lord to show you what he's trying to teach us in these days. Because I think it's so important as we look back, uh, especially in an Old Testament book, that we look back through the lens of Jesus. And that's what we're going to try to do this morning. Now, son of man, take a block of clay and put it in front of you and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it. Erect siege works against it build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. Then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. After you finish this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem and with Bared arm, prophesy against it. I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word this morning. Now this morning, for a few minutes, we're going to talk about our sin. We rarely, if ever, feel the full weight of of our sin. I think one of the main reasons is that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And we also have a lot of distractions in our life. We, we're busy people. And we seldom take the time to focus on the ugliness of our sin in the sight of God. We often fail to appreciate the depth and darkness of our sin because we fail to understand God's view of sin. And we mistakenly believe his grace means he's soft. And after you read chapters 4, 5, and 6 in Ezekiel, you won't think that any longer. In fact, Paul reminds us, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And he says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The desire to continue living in sin shows a misunderstanding of God's abundant grace and a contempt for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We need God's help to see the depth of our sin. And in this second vision, God is showing Ezekiel the persistent idolatry of the Israelites, both in the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And part of God's promise is to help Ezekiel and those living in exile understand just how much God despises 
the sin of idolatry. So what is idolatry? It is the worship of someone or something other than God as though it were God. In other words, idolatry is loving someone or something more than you love God. Think about uh, the Israelites when they were in the wilderness and they, they built the golden calf and worshiped this idol. That's what we're talking about. The Bible reminds us that, that God is a jealous God. And the first commandment actually prohibits idolatry. You shall have no other gods before me. A greater understanding of the irreverence of sin enables us to have a greater understanding and appreciation for God's grace. We tend to talk about grace without ever acknowledging our guilt before God and our deserved judgment for the sin in our life. And on the other hand, we, we tend to talk about sin and condemnation without ever applying the healing touch of God's grace. When I was a pastor at Trinity Weoka, one year, Tammy and I uh, did a little workshop with our youth and we got these little makeup mirrors. You remember that, I'm sure. And I got some little pads and some pencils and we separated them in this big room and so they could be by themselves and not talk to each other. And we instructed them to go and sit and look into this mirror, to look at their reflection and think about their sin. Because that's how God sees you. He sees you. He sees the sin in your life. And I said, then I want you to write down on the pad how that makes you feel. And they wrote down some things and a lot of them were convicted of their sin that day. But we didn't send them away feeling convicted and feeling like they were you know, still living in that sin. We helped them to come to to understand how the forgiveness of Jesus erases that sin in their life. When we ask Jesus to forgive us of that sin, he, for, he remembers it no more as far as the east is from the west. And they left freed that day. We, we don't ever want anyone to think that they are lost in sin because Jesus is the Savior. He, he can help us to be redeemed from our sin. And in our text for today, we find both topics clearly addressed. Not only God's wrath and God's judgment, but God's grace. And as we will see, God's judgment is never devoid of grace. But before we get to His grace, we must first feel the weight of sin. When was the last time you confessed your guilt before God? When was the last time you realized just how desperately you needed God's grace in your life? God is grieved by our sin. We should be just as grieved by our, by our sin as God is. And Ezekiel helps us to see God's view of sin knowing that it will ultimately lead to forgiveness and restoration. In chapter 4, Ezekiel received God's commandment to depict Jerusalem on a clay tablet like a child playing with toy soldiers. Some of you men may have played the game Risk, you know, where you're trying to take over the world. I don't think any of the ladies played that game. Y'all probably played Hooks and Ladders or something. But, you know, he's got this game in front of him, really. And Ezekiel arranges his siege wall around his clay Jerusalem along with the encampments of siege armies and their battering rams. And finally, Ezekiel makes an unbreakable barrier between himself and the scene he has constructed. And this barrier symbolized the wall that stood between God and the sinful Jewish nation so that God could no longer look upon them with approval and blessing. This was a sure sign that God would not intervene in the destruction of Jerusalem and his judgment was coming. In other words, our sin separates us from God and his protection. That's what really Ezekiel is trying to help the people of Israel who are living in exile understand. And then God asked Ezekiel to do something even more bizarre. God commanded him to enact another sign related to judgment against Israel. He said, lay on one side and, and, and lay the iniquity of, of the nation of Israel on, on your other side and and then turn over and, and lay on your other side and lay the iniquity of Judah on that side for as many years as they have sinned against me. 
You see, God was emphasizing his point to the Israelites that they had sinned against him and he had judged them and his punishment is forthcoming. God says this, because you defile my sanctuary with all your vile images and detectable practices, I will withdraw my favor and I will not look on you with pity or spare you. He was just as concerned about the way they behaved as he was the idols that they were worshiping. He's just as concerned about the way we behave as well. In other words, God gave them over to their sim the sinful desires of their heart. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. And chapter five begins with a fourth sign. He says, use a sharp sword as a barber's razor. In other words, he took a stone and he sharpened this sword until it was as sharp as a razor. And then God instructed him to cut off the hair on his head and the hair on his face. And shaving his hair was a sign of mourning and a sign of great disgrace. The hair of the priest was a mark of his consecration to God's service. So everyone who saw Ezekiel would have understood the symbolism. But in chapter 6, thank God for chapter 6, we see God's grace. God tells Ezekiel, but I will save some, a remnant. Then those who escape will remember me. How I have grieved by their adulterous hearts and, 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 and which have turned away from me and by their eyes which have lusted after their idols. God is grieved by our sin. But even after all the Israelites did to defile God's sanctuary and worship other gods and their detestable acts, God is still gracious to his people. God is a just God, but he is also a gracious God. So why did God ask Ezekiel to do all these bizarre things? You know, I asked that question to myself the other day as I'm reading these three chapters. I'm thinking the things that God is asking Ezekiel to do, some of this stuff is crazy. It's bizarre. I believe God wanted to ensure Ezekiel's loyalty. Are you on the right side? Are you on God's side? I think God wants to make sure that we have pledged our allegiance to him as well. Paul said, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Everything you say and do and think, though, informs God whose side you are on. Our evil behavior makes us enemies of God. But God has made a way for us to be reconciled with Him. And it's the finished work of the cross. Secondly, I believe God wanted to see if Ezekiel would be obedient to the things God was asking him to do. Are you willing to do anything God asked you to do? Ezekiel was. In fact, he did everything God ever asked him to do. He was obedient to God in every way. Paul told the Corinthian church, our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools. Michael thought her husband David was a fool when he danced before the Lord as they brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. He thought he was going to walk into his house and go upstairs and talk to his wife and she was going to commend him for worshiping the Lord with power and might, and she said, you're a fool. People thought Noah was a fool for building an ark in the desert until it started raining. Are you willing to do whatever God asks you to do, even if it makes you look foolish in the eyes of the world? Years ago, I was working at Gunner Air Force Base. I was having a conversation with a man and I was telling him why I didn't go to NASCAR races anymore. You, you need to know that I started going to NASCAR races in 1975, and I've been going there a long time. And I was telling him that I'd given my life to the Lord, and I didn't feel like that was a place I needed to be anymore. I didn't need to walk with the Lord <laughs> at Talladega or at the infield where I used to go. And all of a sudden, this lady interrupted our conversation, and she said, well, my husband's a preacher and he goes to Talladega twice a year. I said, tell me more. 
And so she told me that he was the president of Alabama Raceway Ministries, ARM. And so I got together with this man and I started talking to him about, you know, going and doing ministry at Talladega. Every time the race, it was twice a year, so every time they were racing at Talladega, I'd go up there and do ministry. And he said, what did you used to do when you went to Talladega? And I said, well, I was a happy-go-lucky guy in the infield, you know, partying with everybody else that was in the infield. He said, that's where I want you to do ministry. And I was thinking, wow, okay, this is going to be a little hard. This is going to be tough. But God was calling me to go to the place where I was before, but with a different attitude. He wanted me to love him enough so that I would share my faith with the people I used to be. And it was a little intimidating, but I, and I did it for a couple of years before going to seminary. But one thing I learned was that when you put God first, then he wants to bless you with the things you love because when the race is going, you can't talk to people because you can't hear anything. So I'd watch the race. And then when the race was over, I'd go back to witnessing and talking to people and telling them about the love of Jesus. And I'd take this little pamphlet with me. And I had hundreds of these little pamphlets. And I'd walk up to somebody and I'd say, Hi, my name's Matt Albritton. I'm with the Alabama Raceway Ministries. Would you like a race schedule? And they say, Yes. And I said, On the back are the four stops to win the race of life. Now, sometimes they would hand it back to me. Sometimes they'd wad up and throw it in my face. Sometimes they'd cuss me out, tell me to leave the presence. But then other times, they say, tell me more about the four stops to win the race of life. Will you pray for me? And I was able to lead people to Jesus in the infield at Talladega. And I was able to pray with people in the infield at Talladega. Because I love God enough to do what he was asking me to do. Are you willing to do anything that God asks you to do? Are you willing to get outside of your comfort zone? Are you willing to walk in the truth even if it makes you look foolish to the world? You see, Ezekiel was living in the presence of God and he walked in the truth. When you live in the presence of God, you will want to walk in a way that brings glory and honor to His holy name. You walk in obedience even if it makes you look foolish in the eyes of the world. And if you are living in the presence of Jesus, then you will walk in the truth. But the Christian walk is not something we do one or two hours on Sunday morning. Being a Christian is a full-time occupation, as we are told by Paul in Colossians 3. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for people. It is for the Lord Jesus Christ who you serve. To walk is to go. Jesus said, go, therefore, and make disciples. It's an action. It's what we do. It's the journey we take. It's the progress that we make. It's the going. It's the being. It's the doing. Paul encourages us, uh, encourages us to walk in the finished work of Jesus. It's the path that God wants us to walk. It's the path of God's victory. It's God's great mercy and grace that He has given us for new life. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are His workmanship, and we are able to walk in His ways when we are in His presence. And this is the beauty of what God has done for us. When we walk in the finished work of the cross, we walk in faith, we walk in service, we walk in holiness, and we walk in victory. We should be walking according to our position. So who are we? Well, Paul tells us we are a royal priesthood. That's why Paul says to walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. God's calling defines the course of our life. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He goes on to say, for once you were once darkness. Not you were in darkness, but you were darkness. But now you are the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. If we can trust the Lord, then we can walk in His truth. We will see the fruit of the Spirit grow in our lives and once we get our walk right, then we're able to do the good works that God has prepared for us to do. 
Now, Michael Jordan is arguably one of the best basketball players who ever walked on a court. And his six championships stand as one of the great achievements in basketball history because he won them in clusters, two three-peats, 91, 92, and 93, 96, 97, and 98. But listen to what he said. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost over 300 games. 26 times I was asked to take the winning shot and I missed. I failed over and over and over again in life. And that's why I succeed. Losing a game or missing a game winning shot doesn't determine your success, but you can't give up. You have to keep playing the game. In life, you're going to be knocked down. You're going to try something and, and you're going to fail at times, but that will not determine your success. The real failure is when you stop trying. But you are not alone any more than Michael Jordan played basketball by himself. Think about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus for a minute. On that day, Jesus was raised from the dead. And these two disciples were walking back to Emmaus and talking. The disciples were trying to make sense of all the things that had happened to them over the weekend. Jesus had been crucified and buried, and now his body was missing. Their whole world had been turned upside down. Then they heard what the women at the tomb had said. But their words seemed to be like idle talk and they did not believe them. They were troubled. Maybe there are some, some things that are troubling you today. Maybe you came in here with some troubling thoughts in your mind. Maybe you're confused as to what you need to do next. Perhaps your world has been turned upside down with loss of life or pain or someone in the hospital that you dearly love. What happened next to the disciples should give you hope. Jesus drew near to them and walked with them. Jesus wants to walk with you this morning. He wants to walk with you in your struggles. He wants to walk with you in your problems. He wants to walk with you in your confusion. And He wants to walk with you in your pain. Let Him walk with you this morning. But He also wants to walk with you in your faith. And he wants to walk with you in your service. He wants to walk with you in your holiness. And he wants to walk with you in your victory. Because we can have victory in Jesus. Sometimes we don't recognize Jesus when he's with us. But last week we were reminded that God said, I am with you always. So no matter where you are on your journey right now, God is with you. Even when you feel alone, you're not alone. And Jesus doesn't force himself into our lives. He doesn't walk into our, our lives and like old John Wayne and kick the door in and say, hey, I'm here. But when you call upon his name, he answers. And he comes to help us in times of trouble. And Jesus wants you to know this morning that he is alive we serve a risen Savior, and He's in the world today. When He broke the bread with His disciples, their eyes were opened and they recognized Him. Walking with God is an expression of our life in this world. It's how we acknowledge that we're on God's side. It's how we show our loyalty and obedience to God. So walk in the finished work of Jesus. Walk worthy of your calling Walk in His light. Walk in His love. It's a path that God wants you to walk. And it's the path of God's victory. And if you are living in the presence of Jesus, then you will walk in His truth. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being long-suffering. Thank you for your grace and your mercy today. Thank you for always being there for us. Whenever we call your name, you answer. You are our constant help in times of trouble. And Lord, you want to walk with us today. Walk with us, Lord. Walk beside us. 
walk before us. Lord, we just need you to know that we love you, that we want to walk with you. And Lord, I pray today that if anyone is struggling, that you will walk with them in that struggle. If anyone is in pain, that you'll walk with them in that pain. If anyone is battling depression, that you'll walk with them in that depression. If anyone is battling, Lord, just walk with them. Lord, let them know that you're right there with them, that your promise to never leave us nor forsake us is a promise that we can count on. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Maybe you've been struggling a little bit to walk with the Lord, but he hasn't stopped walking with you. We just have to open our eyes and open our ears and open our minds to his presence and then be ready to receive what he has to give us. His presence brings peace into our lives. He is the Prince of Peace. As you walk with the Lord, I pray that his peace will be poured out into your life and that others will see his light and his love and his glory in your walk. Amen.